Turn our Bibles to the book of Genesis, chapter 7. In Genesis chapter 7, we're going to start with verse 10 as a way of introduction. I thank you for all your prayers, and I did like the chicken card. It was good. There's only one thing, another thing, I thought of another thing that was bad about it. I mean, it was a good card. I liked it. Did you ever heard of an earworm? You know what an earworm is? It's a song that gets stuck in your head, and you can't get it out. And I had to, you know, <laughs> well, anyway, you, know, you get the picture. That, that chicken thing is, is a, a, a catchy tune, isn't it? Oh, maybe you want to go to a ball game. But anyway, let's start with uh, Genesis chapter 7, starting with verse 11, verse 10, excuse me. And it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were on the earth. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. On the very same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, And Noah's wife and the three wives of his sons with them entered the ark. They and every beast after its kind, all cattle after their kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth after its kind, and every bird after its kind, every bird of every sort. And they went into the ark to Noah two by two of all flesh in which is the breath of life. So those that entered male and female of all flesh went in, as God had commanded him, and the Lord shut him in. Now the flood was on the earth forty days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. The waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth, and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. The waters prevailed fifteen cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts, and every creeping thing creeps on the earth and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. And the waters prevailed on the earth 150 days. Let's pray. Our Father God, again we come to your word. We realize, as the song said, that you are faithful. Father, you are faithful in the good times. You are faithful in the bad times. You are faithful in many ways in different shapes and forms. Father, your faithfulness is great. You have taken us, Father, through many, many trials and through many tribulations but yet you are faithful. And Father, we thank you that here in the message of our our scriptural text today, Father, we see that Noah is going to go through the flood, but you were faithful. Father, we thank you for the faithfulness of your love, your mercy, your grace, and the faithfulness, Father, of all that you have given us. Be with us now as we come to this point and this time, Father, as we continue in your word, that our hearts would be open to receive the message, that our hearts would be open, Father God, that we might be overflowing with the strength and the mercy and the grace that you have given it to us, Father. And then we ask, Father, that as we leave this place, that it would be good that we have been here and that we might be sharing the good news of your love and your grace and your mercy to all that we meet. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In the book of Exodus, we, or Exodus, excuse me, in Genesis chapter 7 and verse 10, we see the Bible says, and it's come to pass, after seven days the waters of the flood were on the earth. Now the seven days, as it came to pass after the seven days. If you remember last week, we talked about how God said to Noah, come on in. Come on into the ark. Come in here to the ark. Meaning that God was already there. Noah and his family moved into the ark. They took everything out of their home. They cut all the bridges. They blew up all the bridges behind them, so to speak. They left their home. They left a lot of possessions, perhaps. 
some things that were reminded of the old life, and they brought them into the ark. There they, they made the ark their home. And for seven days, Noah and the family were in the ark, and Noah was going out with his sons, going out, finding those clean animals. Remember, I told you that God brought the animals to Noah, but he said to Noah, you're going to go out and get the clean animals. Why? Because those clean animals were going to become sacrifices later. And as David said, remember, he said, I will not offer any sacrifice that did not cost me anything. And so therefore, God sent them out to go get those animals, those clean animals, to be used for sustenance later. As you remember, last week, the Bible says that God allowed them to begin to eat meat. And then also after that, they were going to use them for sacrifices all the way up, those animals and their, their uh, uh, legacy, so to speak, all the way to the temple, to the very last lamb that was killed or slaughtered on the altar, and Jesus was given as the sacrifice for us. So we see that God had prepared Adam, or excuse me, Noah. When did this happen? When did this happen? Well, it depends on what calendar you use. The Bible says here in verse, verse 10 that, that it happened after seven days when they were in the ark. Well, we see again in verse 1, the Bible says here, in, or verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. When did that happen? We're going to see something in just a moment, but I want to show you in a way of introduction, when did this happen? Well, if you go according to the Jewish calendar, Moses is writing this, by the way, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. God gave him the ability to write this account of Noah. But we see here that he writes it sometimes in relationship to the present. And so he's using the calendar that God had given them. And God gave them two starting points, remember? The month of Tishri, by the way, happens in about September, August, September, in that time period, or maybe September, October, it depends on which time period. That was the month that they had the civil calendar beginning, the new year, the Rosh Hashanah. And so if you went that way, uh, that would probably take it into November. It would have been the month that it started, the second month, November. Or if you got into Tishri, or excuse me, in Nisan, the first of the month, which was the spiritual calendar, was Passover. And that happens in March or April, which would have provided a second, two months later, into May perhaps. And so it could have happened in May or in November. Now, a lot of tradition, a lot of, leg, uh, of, of legends throughout the time basically point to November because November, throughout all the history of mankind and through all the different traditions and, and legends and stuff, use November as the month of death. So it's a very interesting thing. Do we, do we speculate on that? Yeah, we, God doesn't say exactly what day it was, but we can speculate. But I'll, you'll see in a moment why I'm doing this, because I think it's important that we understand that God is very specific in this. The important factor about the flood to remember, and I want you to remember this most of all, because it does have a relationship to Genesis chapter 1. It does have a relationship to Adam. It does have a relationship to all these matters. First of all, we need to understand that the most important thing about the flood is that it changed everything concerning the original earth. Everything was changed. When the fall came, when Adam sinned, everything was changed in the aspect of the spiritual world. Life was changed. Hearts were made different. Uh, sin prevailed over the world. Animals were different. The stars, the moon, all these things figured into sin. When the fall came, things changed. But as the Andalusian world began to, to digress into more and more corruption, God said, as you remember, it grieves me that I've made man, and so I'm going to destroy it. I'm going to destroy all that's living on the earth except one man, Noah. He found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, what we understand that after the flood, everything changed. Continents changed. The flow of the ocean changed. The flow of the oxygen or the air currents changed. Everything changed about the earth. Rivers changed. You couldn't find the same rivers anymore, even though they renamed the rivers. Some of them they renamed the same that were in the early part of Genesis. But they weren't necessarily the same rivers. Everything changed. Did you see that in the news the other day? You could go down to the Salmoni Reservoir 
and see that city that once was underwater, that because of the drought, the waters come down, and you can go there to that city? You know, if a person had lived in that city earlier and gone back, they would say, it's all changed. Everything's changed. Where, 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 did, where did we do here? And, and where was the tree at where, where we first carved our initials in it as young couples? Where was the school I used to go to? Everything changed when the waters came. And so, beloved, the same thing with the flood. That was just a little localized flood down the Salamone uh, Reservoir. But we have here a worldwide global flood. It changed everything. That's why when scientists go and look at things, these, these ungodly atheistic scientists that believe in evolution, when they begin to try to search things out and when they use evidence to back up their claims, folks, they're using what most of your police uh, uh, forensics uh, would say, the people who, who study all this stuff, CSIs and all that, would say they have contaminated evidence, do they not? And so that all that they look at tells them what happened at the flood. At the flood. They don't know what happened before. They can't tell you where the beginning was or where the origin of the earth was. Why? Because everything was changed after the flood. We have the only account, folks, and it's right here in your Bible. This is the only account that will tell you emphatically how everything came to be. Everything else is guesstimate based on contaminated evidence. And if you brought that evidence into a court of law today, any judge in his right mind would kick it out, wouldn't he? Imagine trying to convince anyone with contaminated law or with contaminated evidence. Contaminated law is enough, but contaminated evidence would be bad, wouldn't it? Well, can I say it more in our vernacular? If the glove don't fit, you must acquit, right? Well, if it doesn't fit to what the Bible says, we must understand somebody's wrong here, isn't, aren't they? Well, anyway, let's go back to our, our epic judgment of the flood here in verse 11 through 16. We see this epic judgment of the flood. Nothing has ever happened like it before, and nothing has ever happened like it again. In fact, God later on says in our text, I'll never do this to the earth again. We see here in verse 11 and 12 the deluge the deluge of punishment. God said, I'm going to flood the world. He told Noah, I'm going to bring a flood. Now, folks, if it was just a little local flood, why would Noah have to build an ark? Just move your family, duh. You wouldn't need a big, huge ark. You wouldn't need something to carry all the animals. You wouldn't need something to have an opportunity to carry as many people as possible. Why not just move, you know? The bottom line is it was global. Look at verse 11 again, the commencement of God's judgment. The timing of the flood. According to the Jewish rabbis, they believe that the flood happened 1,656 years after the creation. 1,656 years. So if you use their timetable, if you use Noah's timetable, on the year 1,656 in the second month of November on the 17th day, we see here according to this, there are a lot of details in it, aren't they? Look at verse 11 again. The Bible says, In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day. On that day. Folks, that's pretty explicit, is it not? God is using language here to show us that this is a trustworthiness of the word of God, that this indeed happened. Folks, we have Bible scholars, we have antagonistic almost said got agnostic and atheist together came out antagonistic which suits them both well by the way the atheists and the agnostics both all claim that this is all myth this is all myth folks this sounds pretty specific to me pretty good details here there are ancient accounts of the flood in most every every groups of people now by by the way those are contaminated many of them are contaminated by their own paganism Later on, after the flood, after the Tower of Babel, they became contaminated with their own legends and lords. But most all of your early, early peoples believed and taught in a flood. Do you know the flood itself was believed in and taught all the way up into the 1700s? It wasn't until the 1700s that men began to question whether it was real or not. Now, folks, I mean, you from 1700s to the year 2000, you say, well, that's a couple hundred years. But look at the... From the, all the way from the Noah's Ark to the 1700s. That's a long time too, isn't it? 
<clears throat> so we see here the trustworthiness of the flood. It really did happen. The last part of verse 11 and verse 12, we see the consummation of God's judgment. The Bible says here, On that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. Now, we see the convulsion of the cisterns here. In verse 11b, we see that there were great reservoirs of water underneath the earth that God had collected through creation. Through the time of creation, God had put those waters underneath the surface of the earth to be used. Well, how were they used, Pastor? Well, do you remember that the Bible says that there was no rain before Noah's time, so therefore the waters came up as a mist and watered the land? And so we had these, for lack of a better term, miniature geysers that would come up, and they would water the land, and so it was a lush garden. It was a beautiful place. It was green. It was full of all kinds of things. In fact, you can find fossil records of some of the things before the flood. And they'd say, well, it happened millions and millions and millions of years ago. Afraid not. Wrong again. Contaminated evidence. Can you say that? Contaminated evidence. It's true. But we see here the convulsion of the cisterns. The Bible says it this way. The fountains of the great deep, they broke open. Rather than being sustained as God had had them to come up and miss the earth, God says we're going to open them up. So a great convulsion happened. A great earthquake now, did it happen in several places? I believe so. I believe the earth began to quake, and I believe the earth began to break open, and as the continents began to shape and all of that, that these great geysers of, of water came up from the deep. Now, the rabbis believed that the water was hot water because it was closer to the center of the earth, and it was actually pretty hot, <coughs> scalding water, <coughs> excuse me, as you would get in some type of geyser like Old Faithful. But the bottom line is that this water came up and caused great, great catastrophes and great disaster with tsunamis and all the manner of that. If you go to the Creation Museum, one of my favorite places is the Noah's Ark exhibit where you can go inside the ark, so to speak. And they have on there a screen that shows how many minutes basically it would have taken to cover the entire earth with, with that kind of flood coming. Unbelievable. So we see here that there were great earthquakes and great tsunamis here in verse 11. And then verse 11 and 12, we also see the collapse of the canopy. What do you mean, Pastor? Look again at verse 11 and 12. <clears throat> the Bible says, And the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. Now, Pastor, do you believe there are windows in heaven? No, I don't believe there are windows in heaven like you and I know windows. But folks, there are a lot of people, a lot of Christian scientists and a lot of Christian, Christian creationists who believe that when the earth was originally created, it had a canopy about it, that there was a vapor of water around the earth protecting the earth. And we see that in Genesis chapter uh, 1 and verse 6 and 7. Turn back to there. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. The Bible says, And God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament with the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Many of your Bible scholars believe that there was a water vapor that was high up in our atmosphere that perhaps protected us from the UV rays, and that's why people lived a lot longer before the flood than they did after the flood. And there's also the matter of contamination of DNA as it goes through the, the, through the time period. But anyway, the whole bottom line is that this vapor, by the way, if you go far enough, that vapor, if you'll know, was ice crystal. How could, you, how could the, uh, God contain the water above the, the air? It's easy. It was ice crystal, just like uh, the rings around Saturn would be. And so we had this, this covering, and it began to fall. The Bible says the windows opened. And as it began to fall, it began to melt. And as it began to melt, what did it turn into? Water. Now, that's a lot of water to come down off all over the earth. And so we see the collapse of the canopy. God used the things already made to bring destruction upon the earth. And so we see here in verse 11 and 12, we see the, the, the deluge of punishment. This is how God caused the flood to happen. 
In verse 13 through 16, we see the directory of passengers. Again, God is going to record the people. Have you found out, have you noticed that in the scripture texts that we've been using with this, that over and over and over, God is using names like Noah and, and uh, Japheth and Ham and Shem and all of this, that God is naming names. Why is he doing that? He's wanting you to understand that this is not a story. This is not a myth. This is an actual event with actual people. And so we see here the Lord's people in verse 13. The Bible says, On the same day, Noah and Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and Noah's wives and the three wives of uh, of his sons with them entered the ark. Pretty specific again. By the way, we're not a number to God. Do you know that? We're not a number to God. God knows our name. God knows who's going when the trumpet sounds. God knows who's going to heaven right now. And so we must understand that God in that time knew Noah and loved Noah and loved the people of Noah. In verse 13, we see the Lord's recognition. The Bible says, on that same day, on that very same day, the day that the flood began, the day that they walked into the ark for the last time, the day that the last clean animal was gathered up and they went up the, the ramp into the door, the very same last day it began. We see the Lord's review. Again, the list of those who entered the ark. Again, it shows consistency. Again, it shows accuracy. The Bible, I've heard all my life, is full of controversy, is full of contradictions. Show me. That's my question. Show me. And you know, everyone who showed me all these different things, I have been able to see in the Bible where that is not true. It's just a matter of misinterpretation. Not of the Bible's truth, not of the Bible's reliability, but rather on misinterpretation of the scripture by the individual or by others they had heard. So we see again the Lord's review. He brings the people in mind so that we can know an accuracy and a consistency of God's holy word. And then look at the Lord's register in verse 13. The Bible says, with them entered the ark. With them, that's the Lord's register. He's got them all registered. By the way, did you know there is a book in heaven with your name on it? You know, I think God had that right there on on his registry. I think he had that already in his book that those people were going to be saved. And I believe God has your name, as the Bible says, and my name in the Lamb's book of life if we are a born-again Christian. And we see here that God named these people. He knew them, and he had a registry of them. Look at verse 14 through 16. We see the Lord's passengers. The livestock are present, for goodness sake. Again, for sustenance and for sacrifice. They brought all the animals, the unclean animals, the animals that later on would be known as non-kosher. Later on, the Bible says that Jewish people were to see them as animals they wouldn't eat. A good, observant Jewish person today will not eat a pig. They will not have bacon. They will not have a ham sandwich. And the reason for that is the Bible had declared it unclean. And as a Jewish individual, they try to keep kosher law. But what we see here, it began with the, with the ark where the God says, I want you to get clean animals. Remember I told you, the first time that we see a clean animal mentioned in the Bible was here with the flood. Why? God is already, already showing a difference between what is going to be eaten and what's not going to be eaten for the Jewish people. He's already separating them. Look at verse 15. We see the loading of those pure. In verse 15, the Bible says, And they went into the ark to Noah. Who are they? Well, in verse 14, every beast of every kind, cattle of every kind, every creeping thing that creeps on the earth of every kind, every gecko, every little snake, every little tortoise, every creeping thing, every little bug that came went right in there with. And do you notice very simply, it says in verse 15, and they went into the ark to Noah. To Noah. Why? Why didn't, why not the Ham, Shem, and Japheth? Again, why not to Noah's wife? You know, women are much better with figures than men, right? I've heard that all my life. They could probably keep a better record. My wife has lists for her lists. It's unbelievable. My wife makes lists every day. I wake up in the morning, she's making a list and checking it twice. She is. She's a list maker. Why didn't they give that to Noah's wife? Noah's wife could have sat there and counted everything. Why didn't they come to her? Because, you see, Noah was the one who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah was the man that God, God introduced. You know, why is it that every person can't come to anyone, but they have to go to Jesus? See, this is a picture of the Lord. 
that came into the ark to Noah. They couldn't come to anyone else. Can't come to the preacher. Can't come to the priest. Can't come to all these different people all around the place. You have to come to Jesus. If you don't come to Jesus, there's no safety. There's no help. There's no security outside the ark of the cross. We see here the loading of the pure. Now, according to the rabbis, these animals were very unique. These animals were special in that they had not cooperated with the corruption of mankind. Now, I don't want to go into all the details of what they talk about, although what that is, but they said these animals have come that God had brought these animals because if God had not called two specific animals, every horse on the, on the planet would have come. If God would have called the horses, why did God say, well, I'll pick him and her, him and her, him and her? The Bible says here that they were unique, that they came to Noah. Why? The rabbis say it's because they were not contaminated with the same contamination that the other animals were contaminated with when they, when they were contaminated by man. Interesting thought, is it not? Why would God, I've often thought, why would God kill all these little animals? All these little puppies and all these little, you know, lions, yeah, made big deal, lions, let them all die off and all this kind of stuff. Why would God do that? Well, folks, listen, the animals were corrupted as the men were corrupted. The whole world, the Bible says, was corrupted. So we see a loading of the pure. In verse 16, we see the legitimacy of the, pastor, of the passengers. In verse 16, so those that entered, male and female, of all flesh, went in as God had commanded. Should be them, huh? Why does it say him? Again, those people were drawn, those animals were drawn to Noah. They were drawn to Noah. Again, we see uh, the legitimacy of the passengers. And then look at the Lord's preservation. In verse 16, the last part of verse 16, the Bible says, as God had commanded him and the Lord shut him in. We see, first of all, in verse 16, the Lord had shut them in. Noah did not close the door. Noah opened and closed the window later on. But Noah did not close the door. The Bible says God shut them in. I've read commentators all over all week long and different places, different things. Every one of them, God shut the door. Now, folks, that's very interesting because God not only shut the door, God sealed the door. God sealed the door. He shut it. He sealed it. He saved them. Huh? Think about that. How close to the gospel is that? How close to the gospel is that? He saved them, he sealed them, and he shut the door of, of salvation and kept them, kept them saved. Huh? We see here a very, very interesting preservation of the people and the animals in the ark. First of all, we see the Lord's compassion. Genesis 6, 8, the Bible says, But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace, didn't say that Noah's wife did, but because of God's grace, Noah's wife came along too. I believe that Noah's wife got saved. I believe Noah's wife believed. And because she believed in the message of Noah that Noah preached, the preacher of righteousness, I believe she was saved because of the faith she had in the message about God's promise that if you get into the ark, you can be saved. I believe the sons got saved that way too, working on the ark. Dad, why are you doing this every day? What is going on? Son, just keep building. Trust in the Lord. Trust in the Lord. He's telling us the truth. This is truth, I'm telling you. And over and over, every day when they made those joints and when they put everything together, finally the son said, you know, I believe. And old Shem said, you know, I, I believe too. And old Ham and Japheth both chimed in and said, you know, I believe too. Mom's, mom's believed and now we want to believe too and be saved. And we see here, we see the Lord's compassion. And the wives came too and said, well, honey, we want to believe too. We want to believe in this salvation. We want to believe that God loves us. We want to believe that God wants to save us. And they went into the ark with them. So we see the Lord's compassion. Then we see the Lord's commission. The Lord had said to Noah, make yourself an ark. You notice he didn't say make an ark for your family. He said, make yourself an ark. <laughs> Once again, if Noah's wife and Noah's Kids had not had gone, what would have happened? Noah would have got on that boat and would have floated all around. And God would have put him to sleep again like he did Adam, take another rib and say, hey, woman, there she is. And that would have been done. I believe God would have done that. But again, through God's compassion, we see here, take an ark, make an ark. 
Then look at the Lord's command, God's covenant of Noah and his family and his command to enter the ark. He said in Genesis 7, 1, very simple, and the Lord said to Noah, come into the ark. Not go into the ark, come into the ark, meaning God was there with him. By the way, folks, we don't go to find salvation. We come in to find salvation. We are in Christ now. So we see here the Lord's preservation and the Lord shut him up. The Lord's closing. But look at the extensive judgment. We see the epic judgment. We see all the matters of it. What about the extensiveness of the judgment? What happened outside the ark? Look at verse 17 through 20. We see, first of all, the waters prevailed. It's an extensive judgment. Water can do many things. Oh, I love it when those geologists say that you look at the Grand Canyon. Yes, as, as Ken Ham says, yes, a, a lot of water, uh, I mean, a little water over a long time caused this Grand Canyon. That's what the, the uh, agnostic and atheists say. Ken Ham says it's different. A lot of water over a short time made this. It's called the flood. It's called the flood. And folks, we have evidence of the flood all where we go by the waters being prevailed over the earth. There's a threefold prevailing. Let's look at it in verse 17. There's the rising of the waters. Look at verse 17. The Bible says very simply, now the, water, uh, now the flood was on the earth 40 days. The waters increased and lifted up the ark, and it rose high above the earth. And so we see here, first of all, the rain continues for 40 days of heavy rain. Now we're talking about the, the, all the canopy collapsing in this 40 days, okay? 40 days of rain, the collapse of the canopy. And then you have the deluge. You have all the, 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 the cisterns and all the things coming up out of the ground. Not only do that, folks, but because of the eruption, you have a lot of volcanic activity. A lot of a volcanic activity, which is causing the ash to go up. It's going to seed those clouds that are coming down. You're going to get more rain after the deluge, after everything uh, collapsed. You're going to have great thunderstorms. You're going to have great uh, storms upon the earth for the first time. So we have the rain continuing for 40 days and the rising of the craft. The ark floats now. And all the people in the ark said, Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo. man, all this water, aren't you glad we came in? Aren't you glad we, we uh, are looking now from inside the ark? Aren't you glad we did what God asked us to do? Folks, I'm telling you, the greatest thing you're going to do, the moment you step your foot on heaven's shore, that first moment you're going to look back and you're going to say, Woohoo! I am sure glad I did what God asked me to do. There's a lot of shouting in heaven. I've told you about my, my friend Michael, Michael Olive, who was a, had muscular dystrophy, who was in a wheelchair all his life. And his family, first time he had three, he had two other brothers that had wheelchairs too. And, and the family asked me, what do you think Michael's doing now? It was several days, a couple weeks perhaps after Michael's death. And they said, what do you think Michael's doing? I said, you know, I don't think they've caught him yet. I just don't think they've caught him yet. The bottom line is, folks, the moment we get to heaven, like they were in the ark, they went, whew, boy, I'm glad this is over. I'm glad we're in the ark. Nobody in the ark said, Boy, I really miss going to McDonald's. I wish we I, I wish we had a hamburger. I wish we had some of them greasy old fries. I really wish. Nobody said that. Nobody said, I sure miss so-and-so. I sure miss going to the theater. I sure miss going shopping. I sure miss going to all the ball games. I sure miss going to all this and that. Folks, there won't be anybody in heaven saying that either. You can't play golf in heaven. You know why I know that? You have a hole-in-one every time. Now, what fun is that? You can't play golf in heaven. Can't play baseball in heaven. Everybody's going to hit home runs. You can't end an inning. There won't be any outs. You can't strike out in heaven. So there won't be any. How can you play baseball in heaven? Football? Can't play football in heaven. You just go on and on. So, folks, the bottom line, nobody's going to say, gee, I sure miss football. I sure miss baseball. I, I sure miss doing this and that. Can't go boating. There's no, there's no big lakes in heaven. There's only a river down the middle of the, of the heaven shore. Folks, there's a lot of things we're going to we're going to miss in heaven, aren't we? Do you really think the people are sitting around heaven today, going, "Gee, what what I'd give for a man for a, a, a one of those greasy little hamburgers down at Castle? What I'd give for that Castle burger?" Nobody's saying that. You know why? Because they're past the judgment. They're in Jesus's hands. They don't think about these old things anymore. These things mean nothing to them anymore. The old life meant nothing to Noah. 
and the people inside the ark, nothing meant to them what meant now that they were in God's hands. We see here the, the, the rising of the waters. Look at verse 18, the raging of the waters. In verse 18, the waters prevailed and greatly increased on the earth and the ark moved about on the surface of the waters. Again, the turbulence of the catastrophe. The great tsunamis came and the great floods came. Do you know one scientist said that the ark more than likely could almost withstand a 90 degree uh, uh, wave coming on top of it. That it was that buoyancy that it could not be flipped over. Unbelievable, isn't it? Unbelievable. That God created them. These huge waves, tsunamis. Listen, the one in Japan was nothing compared to what happened in the flood. Nothing compared to it. Just a little earthquake, and look what happened to Japan. Just a little earthquake. Just right off the, the coast there, there was just a little rumbling, a, a little shifting of the plates, and look at all the lives that were lost. Look at all the floods that happened. Folks, I was absolutely fixed on that screen watching how those tsunamis would come in and literally wipe out cities. Imagine what it was like when the tsunamis of this proportion happened. Unbelievable. We see the ragings of the water, the travail of the craft. That boat was bouncing around. Oh, that boat was bobbing up and down. That boat was shaking, moving and shaking. And Noah and his family were just singing. They were just singing all day long, leaning on the everlasting arms because they were there in the arms of God. We see in verse 19 and 20, the range of the waters. This is the third, third of the prevailing of the waters. The, the Bible says the waters went completely up. In verse, in verse 19, the Bible says, And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heavens were covered, and the waters prevailed 15 cubits upward, and the mountains were covered. So we see the range of it, the further expansion of the flood. The flood went everywhere. It was global. In verse 19, the final extent of the flood in verse 20, it went above the mountains. You could not survive 20 feet above the mountains. How high? I'm not sure how high the mountains were in those early years. I'm not sure how, how high it was, but the Bible says that everything changed. Was Mount Everest there, Pastor? I, I think Mount Everest happened after the flood when everything began to change. It went back and all the plates began to come together. I think there was aftershocks. I think there were volcanoes. I think there was ice problems. I think there was all manner of things that happened after the flood. I think the ice age that everybody talks about, I think that happened after the flood. I think there was a lot of upheaval in that world. They, it was, they were in the ark for a whole year, folks. A whole year. Well, we see here the, 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 the waters prevailed over the earth. But then, sadly to say, the wicked perish. You know, God, the Bible says that God wishes that none would perish. God was not delighted in people dying and going to hell. God never wishes that anyone die and go to hell. The Bible says we choose to do that. By rejecting the way of God, we choose to go to hell. Well, folks, it's true. It's true in Noah's time. Because they reject Noah's word and they reject Noah's way and they reject Noah's God, then, beloved, they died. Did they not? And it's the same way today. God does not send people to hell. People choose to go there. They make the decision to go there by not listening to God and not turning to the word. We see here in verse 21 and 22 the judgment on creation. Look at the extent of God's judgment in verse 21. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts of every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. I've had people ask me, what happened to the unicorn preacher? No unicorn. If it was, it didn't get on the ark, did it? The bottom line, folks, was there was no such thing. You know, some people believe that the unicorn is what they call the rhinoceros today. I've never seen a unicorn like that in any store, but the bottom line is there was no unicorn. There's a lot of lore and legend that we try to discredit the Bible. The reason why they say that, folks, is a lot of times they say, well, see, there were no unicorns, and in the, in, in the, therefore Noah didn't take all the animals. What's wrong? Folks, you've got to listen to some of the silliness of what people try to do to dismiss God's word. In verse 22, look at the exclusiveness of God's judgment. The exclusiveness and all in whose nostrils was the breath of, li uh, of the spirit of life, all that were on, was on the dry land died. No fish died. Well, pastor, water, duh. <laughs> it was all killed by water. The little porpoises, they just went right along, you know. The big whales went right along. 
the little fishes all went to school together and went on down, had all kinds of swimming room. The bottom line is, folks, many of the commentaries I was reading and one of the rabbis that I was reading said, listen, the fish did not go into the corruption of mankind. Everything on earth did. The things under the water did not cooperate with the curse, did not cooperate with the corruption. And so they were allowed to live. God could have killed the, all the fish in the, in the ocean. You know how he could have done it? Very simple. You ever seen guys throw a stick of dynamite into a pond or a lake? Boom goes off. All the fish come to the top. All God could have done is strike that ocean with one big lightning bolt and all the fish would have died. But the bottom line is God let them live. We've got to understand, folks, there was something about this corruption. I don't know exactly what it was except the fact it was sin. And it was so, such a grievous sin that God said, I'm going to destroy man and I'm going to take those that caused that grievous sin and I'm going to put them in prison for all eternity. Folks, I'm telling you, it was a, a wicked time. I can only speculate what happened, but I can tell you it was a wicked time. Now, what the scary thing is, is the Bible says that in the last days, days which you and I are living, that's going to be like Noah's times again. There's going to be a lot of this corruption come back again. Very strange. Finally, we see in verse 23, the judgment of corruption. And so he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the earth or on the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Folks, you have a choice today, either corruption or God, sin or the Savior. That's the only choice they had in Noah's time. And that's the only choice we have today. We see the condemnation of God in this verse. All that was on the earth, so he destroyed all. We see also the compassion of God in this verse. You see, where there is God's judgment, there's also God's compassion. You say, God is a, how could God be a hateful thing? How could God allow people to die? How could God allow disease and all this stuff to happen? Look again at verse 23. The Bible says very simply in all of this, that only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained alive. Why is that? Why is that, folks? Because God gives us a way. You know what, folks? My mother died from, from uh, fibrosis uh, of, of, her, of her, not fibrosis, uh, all of a sudden they want to hold, cystic fibrosis of her lungs. Her lungs turned into leather, basically. She couldn't breathe. She had to, had to wear oxygen the last few weeks of her life. Now, that was my, my mom. My mom walked everywhere. She had a, a great heart, even though she had heart problems in her family, but she walked everywhere. But my mother died a very painful death, eventually by, by a heart attack because it, it just attacked her heart. But the bottom line is this. My mother today has not even one iota of a speck of that disease. My mother has nothing. She, does, she doesn't even have a sneeze. Nobody in heaven has to say, God bless you. <laughs> for a sneeze in heaven. Why is it? There is no sickness. There is no sorrow. There is no more death in heaven. Folks, God loves us so much that he provided a place for us that we can be away from all of this. Nobody's going to live forever in this world. The Bible says a point on a man wants to die. You have an appointment. We have an appointment. But you see, after that, the judgment, meaning we get to go before God one day and give an account of our life lived for him as a Christian or give an account of our life lived for him as a lost person. We see the compassion of God. Finally, in verse 24, we see the waters prevailed 150 days. Forty days of, and nights of heavy rain, the deluge. 110 days of night of continual rain. That is 150 days. If you take 30-day months as in the Jewish calendar, that's five months of rain. Can you imagine five months of rain? Heavy, downpour, rain, unbelievable. But you see, in all of this, again, there is hope. There is hope. Genesis 8.3 says, And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the water decreased. God's judgment is real. God's judgment is purposeful. And God's judgment will one day be drawn away from those who trust in Christ. We are living in the last days. And as a pastor, I must tell you, I have to tell you, I am obliged to tell you, I am under constraint to tell you, judgment is coming again. Judgment is coming 
again. And we must be ready to be taken out of the judgment of God. Now, folks, we have a choice. Either we, like Noah, believe God and trust in God's plan, or like those who perish on the earth, reject Noah's plan, reject the Bible, reject the preacher, and reject God's word and find judgment. That's the choice today, is it not? Well, let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. And Father, we know that this, this flood, this, this matter in the chapter 7, Father, of your word is real. This is not some myth that you just allowed Noah or somebody to write down or Moses to record. But rather, Father, this was a real event and these are real people and these are real tragedies. And none of it had to happen. But, oh, Father, as we see in our last days the corruption coming upon us, and the corruption of this world and all the nasty and terrible things that are happening in this world. People killing people and shooting people. Oh, Father God, what nastiness is going on in the world today. We live in a world of corruption that hates life. We live in a world, Father, that kills babies. We live in a world, Father, that, that uh, laughs and scorns the, the, the aspect of your uh, plan for marriage between a man and a woman. Oh, Father God, we live in a time of, of corruption. But, oh, Father God, this is real, too, today, that judgment is coming, and we must be ready. And, oh, Father God, I pray for everyone in this room that they are ready today for the coming of the Lord, that we can escape the judgment like Noah and not go through this horrible time called the tribulation period. Oh, Father God, be with us today in our times of decisions. Speak to hearts, Father, in this moment, in this time, if there is someone that needs Jesus today, someone who needs to, to go the way. Father, just take away every interference from their heart right now. Take away every thought of tomorrow or yesterday that would interfere with their, their decision. And, oh, Father God, I ask that you give them freedom today to make the decision to believe in you and your plan. And then, Father God, there are Christians who need to come and pray. There are Christians who need to make a decision for you today, Father God. They need to go like Noah and make the decision for themselves. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday.